everyone, and welcome to a Time Shifters podcast special time hop edition. This time we're not talking about a movie. We are talking about an entire season of a television show. We're going to talk about Picard. Yay! And warning, we are going to spoil it. So if you've not seen season three of Picard, move on. <laughs> move on. Wait a week for our full episode. Uh, and come back and listen to this when you get a chance to actually watch the show. Yes, and go watch the show. Go watch the show. Go watch, go the, watch show. the show. Otherwise, uh, sit back and uh, hear our thoughts on Picard. We've been ta- wanting to talk about this for a while, but both of us were, Tom and I here, were quite on, in sync on what we've seen and what we haven't seen. It was kind of one of these things we wanted to just talk about it all <laughs> instead of just one episode at a time. One of the things that I'm just going to start right out of the gate with is it's 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 its cinematic quality about this. It it watches like a ten hour long movie more than it does episode episode episode. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, the production value on this was uh, pretty amazing. They really felt like it, they they pulled out all the stops for yes. this final season. They knew this was going to be the last season of Picard, and they just they said, "All right." Let's let's throw everything on the wall because it's gonna stick. <laughs> Everyone's gonna love this stuff. And this has been I've seen this raised by a few people that there was a ton of fan service and that they were pretty much using fan service rather than story. I'm not saying that those people are wrong. There is lots and lots of fan service, but I don't think it's that harsh. I still ate all the fan service up. Oh, yeah. I mean, I really, truly loved every bit of it. Right down to the the start with a... Um, because I'm all about the ships. I love the ships. And the notion... And, and I, I kind of like the notion that they went with the idea that that even Starfleet can get nostalgic for its own history Mm -hmm. and actually took, made new designs of ships based off of the retro look of what would be for us, the movies era version of TOS. Yeah, no, I love the fact that the the Federation can go retro and it takes us right back to that sweet spot. Absolutely. Because I mean, to this date, uh, no matter how much they update things on their series, the movie Enterprise, the Constitution class refit, is one of the most beautiful things that anyone has ever created. Oh, and, yeah. And the notion that they could, that in theory, uh, an organization like this could recognize those were damn beautiful, and we should go back. <laughs> yeah, so what they call the Titan? A Nouveau Constitution or something Neo like that? Neo-Constitution. Neo-Constitution. Also referred to as Constitution Type 3. Okay. Because I read these things. <laughs> I, I remember uh, it was before I got a chance to start watching it, you made a comment. This was before we started recording. Yeah, we, re- we didn't record anything about it. It was just something we had talked about before we started recording. You made a comment about the bridge of the Titan. Mm-hmm. And I have to agree that is way too freaking big. <laughs> <laughs> you need intercoms to hear each other from one side to the other. Well, and as we progress, uh, uh, just that notion that it, it returned to that, that metal and glass feel. Next Generation and Voyager and all that kind of got away from. They they made everything more comfortable looking. Um, and, and now it's like this. And the fact that that even got laid in as a joke later. Mm-hmm. Later when we get to see. And I'll just spoil it now because we said we were gonna. When we get to a moment where we get to reveal Enterprise D still exists. It's been rebuilt for the museum in loving detail with a perfectly reasonable explanation as to why such a thing would have happened. Picard is there with all of his cherished crew members talking about the having it being glad that they're back, but I really miss the carpet. (laughs) Yes. yes. I agree, Jean-Luc. I agree. (laughs) And it is a different sensibility. Uh, Um, at the time of Next Generation, uh, and uh, and if you're into the full lore of Star Trek, that was probably the most comfortable days of Starfleet and the Federation. Everything just kind of hummed along. 
We're we're friends with the Klingons. The Romulans are quietly in their little nest, not really making any noise. We're out exploring. Why can't we do it in comfort? Yeah. So let's lounge and explore. Absolutely. Maybe maybe that's why uh, Titan's bridge can be so large is because it's got all those uh, flat surfaces for sound to bounce off of. Whereas Enterprise D, it was just built with sound absorbing materials. It, well, it really was. <laughs> it was like sitting. Well, I mean, literally, the bridge looked like you were sitting in your uh, home theater. Yes. <laughs> Complete with Barco loungers. <laughs> so season three, of Picard not only brings back uh, all the the most of the cast of the previous two seasons of Picard, mm. but it reunites the entire next generation. See. Uh, uh, series and uh i loved is that everyone kind of joined in at different times yes it was one at a time it wasn't just like oh look everyone's here i mean it starts out it doesn't i believe the um on the entire the season starts with beverly crusher yes yeah and and, and in dire straits doesn't even open with picard on her own with her son jack they are out they have, well, she and has been separated from everyone else by like 20 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she disappeared pretty much the, just went silent. No one knew what happened to her. Of course, the first person Picard turns to is Riker. Of course. Because he's the one that's in Starfleet still. Yeah. Already saved his bacon once earlier. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yes, sits in the sits in the captain's chair still, more or less. Well, he's a captain without a ship. Yeah, yeah, he uh, he never picked up another ship after his time on the prior Titan. Yeah, and from there, you know, you just slowly get reintroduced to all these people, and eventually they all come together in really a, a fairly natural way for this story. Anyway, none of the uh, reuniting of the characters felt forced. No, no, they they all had their own versions of their lives going on, and it was just the scale of this this situation that allowed for them to all come back together. And th- there was no guarantee they were going to come back together. That, but that's the joy of writing. You can do that. <laughs> and we got. I mean, it's not just next generation that we kind of got nods to. Yeah. We we sort of got a nod. Well, in a big way, we got a nod to uh, Deep Space Nine because the it turns out the one of the main villains of the piece is the Changelings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the Dominion War, of course, gets name checked. Uh, Wolf three five nine gets a big name check. Oh yeah, and then uh, of course we get uh, nods to Voyager because well, a seven's still running around, obviously, right. but we get to see Tuvok too. We get to see Tuvok. Uh, they made mention of Admiral Janeway because they were mm-hmm. t- attempting to contact her. It was always a possibility that she could have shown up. Yeah, I think they had planned something like that, but I think it was just time and logistics. They they couldn't do it. Right, no, because uh, actually that was a further thing jumping around in our timeline. Uh there are a lot of people who had commented if they could have made it come together, it would have meant more if Janeway had commissioned uh, Seven as a captain. Yeah, instead of Tuvok. Instead of Tuvok. But it's still, it was great to see Tuvok actually there and have him in the position to do it as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah, the Changelings, which I have to admit were probably the last villain I would have thought to kind of come back into into the fold. Right, no, I mean, they haven't... A- Considering all of their ability and all that and how aggressive they were (laughs) in Deep Space Nine, um, the fact that they haven't really ever been mentioned in any other Star Trek lore of recent times is is a little stunning. But since we brought them back, I love the way that they were able to um, section off this group of changelings from the overall whole. (laughs) Like... There's what happened with the changelings and how they're. Uh, what, uh, God, I'm gonna be terrible. What are they? What do they call their little big melting pot? Oh right. Uh, oh gosh, I don't remember the the, the link. source. The link. There you go. The link. The great link. Okay, so they're. Um, we're we're suggesting that 
those changelings are probably still in that... They're still in their quadrant, and they're fine. But these were ones that were torn away, and um, and they were tested on. And it, it, it was almost like a perverted version of how Odo came to be. Mm. Yeah. Oh, oh, very good point. I forgot, because, yeah, he was just an experiment in a Cardassian... Uh, lab wasn't he he was and it was it was one of those things they didn't know what he was so they just saw this ooze that seemed to react to things so they were studying it and it odo took shape out of that and developed his personality and his feelings out of all that and that's essentially what these guys did only apparently their torture they already, people already knew those were changelings and we are trying to learn how to kill them. Yes. Yeah. No, and I like that they did bring up that, you know, Starfleet isn't always bright and shiny. Mm -mm. It has its darker side. And one might argue that whenever you're in situations where you're going to have conflicts with whoever, there's always going to be that darker side for what I guess is supposed to be intended as the greater good. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody has to own that. And it, it, it's interesting whenever Star Trek brings that in because there's supposed to be that beacon of light and hope. We're supposed to be able to rise above that. But can you? Can you? That, and that's part of the human struggle, too, is can you have utopia without something underlying keeping it in place which may require something a little more dark well and it's they definitely explored that a lot in deep space nine and even mm -hmm. uh to some extent in voyager yes that was not something that they ever really truly explored in the next generation no no everything was sunshine and rainbows for the most part the, <laughs> yeah. the borg was your big one but that that was the and, and that's probably still my only regret from this series. It was a great way to end it, but we keep going back to the Borg. The Borg are ever-present all the time, yeah. and no matter how many times we seem to defeat them, they're always back. That's the only little takeaway I can come from with yeah. that is that it was like, uh, couldn't we have gone with another villain or something? And I was confused, too. I don't remember season two well enough. What happened to, like, the Jurati Borg? See, that that's where I'm at, too. The Jurati Borg, where we left that in season two, is they were there at that, uh, essentially, that portal, that gateway that essentially ripped open in the galaxy. And the Jurati Borg queen had essentially said, we're going to be the watcher at the gate. They're going to stay. They're going to be there. They're going to essentially protect the galaxy. <laughs> okay. Still, I'm surprised they didn't get even so much as a, as a mention in this story. Well, yeah, this is where things with Borg get a little weird, because, I mean, they're always supposed to be part of the greater collective, so they don't sense that there's another Borg queen still in, in, in existence, even though, granted, she came out of a different kind of timeline. I, I think it's one of those, they wrote themselves into a corner and decided, let's just not mention it. Yeah, I think that must be it. So the season starts out with, um, we don't know it's the changelings, and so we just have this uh, mad captain with this giant ship that can seemingly do anything, and with portal weaponry and all that. And I'll, I'll admit it, I didn't care, and I don't care for that type of character. Uh, no. Th there's, there's the Joker in Batman. Right. And then there's everybody that thinks it's really cool to have a villain that's like the Joker. Huh. Just that completely insane off the rails. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't find it entertaining. I, I, don't, I don't like that kind of villain because I feel like the only reason you're doing it is because it's somehow you think it's popular <laughs> yeah. I, I never really quite understood the the communication method that um, she was using to work back with what 
ended up being a Borg queen. Right. Um, so I'm not sure how cutting her own hand off uh, translates into a, a way to communicate with her. Yeah, it that was something that I think they did just to build the mystery. It made no sense, but they felt like, oh, wouldn't it be cool and won't, wouldn't it be mysterious and won't people wonder? Because we never kind of fully connected those two, it's like we had the Changeling chapter... And then we had the Borg chapter. They could have stood to have a little more context into how the Borg and the Changelings ended up working together. I mean, it, it's clear why the Changelings were into this. This was this was that particular group's. They they weren't interested in their own um, their own kind anymore. This particular little sect of Changeling is entirely out for revenge against. The Federation and Starfleet for what they had done to them specifically and how they handled the Dominion War to, to, to at least end it. But we never quite got the how did the Changelings get in touch with this particular Borg Queen to do anything? Mm -hmm. Like, how did that come about? Because it seems like an important part of the story. I think there's a lot of things throughout this series that was just... Because the plot said so. Because we need it to be in order to get to this next point. Right. No. Uh, and, and you felt those moments. But again, me being me, I, I was just thoroughly in love with this entire venture. That even when I can identify these parts where I go, yes, you're right. There, There's a gap there. There's there, there should have been a little more storytelling. Did we have to go in that direction? Absolutely agree. Uh, but I still loved, like, every moment of this thing. <laughs> yeah. What did you think of uh, what's it, Ed Sp uh, Spielers as Jack Crusher? Beverly's son. Beverly and Picard's son, as we discover. The way they handled it, I thought they did really well. The notion that um, if Beverly found out she was pregnant with Picard's child given their on-again, off-again, Rocky, and they're very... I loved all the moments in this series where they pointed out how much Picard is not always the hero that that we all know him to be. Like, he is the hero from the perspective of the great galaxy. But if you're having one-on-one -one relationships with Picard, that's tough. Mm -hmm. That's really tough because he does put the grander whole above all things. So if you're trying to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with that man, that's a virtual impossibility. You will always lose. You're always going to come second to whatever is the greater good, right? Right. So her, the notion that they got together in this moment... Um, where maybe he was having more of a feeling his family mood kind of on, but then obviously something came up and mm -hmm. the great Picard had to go into the world to save the day. Uh, and Beverly not seeing that this is not the environment in which I try to have a child with this man. So the fact that she disappeared and just raised him on her own, totally I'm on board with all of that. But anytime you make a chosen one kind of character, that starts, it's just, it's a trope that's overdone. Mm -hmm. So that part, that was my only kind of reservation with there being a Jack Crusher. It's also a little weird that she named him after her husband. Her, yeah, her late husband. But I think even um, Picard mentions that had he known, he would have suggested the same thing. Because he was he, his best friend. Right. Oh, no, no, no. I totally get that. It's all very touching. And again, that's that's just fan. That, that's placating to the fans all, o all over the place. It's like, oh, I know what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You, you just wanted to revisit all that. But yeah, it's that whole he's somehow special. But even though they went with that trope, they did it in a fairly creative way. I loved how tidy they call all the way back to best of both worlds and suggest that when Picard is taken and made Borg and they've 
they kind of said all of this at the time, just never really got into the more of the biological. But when the Borg say they're going to take you, they want their they want your biology and your technology. Mm-hmm. It's not a stretch to think that when they take you, your biology gets altered just as much as the technology they integrate into you. Yeah. So, I like that they, they, they took it all the way back to from best of both worlds. They took it back to uh, all good things, uh, where we find out Picard has that Iramati syndrome, mm-hmm. or they think that's what it is, and it turns out that it was that's a side effect of whatever minor weird Borg DNA or whatever that they hid within him. Oh, I, I love the, how that ties in, like at first contact when he can still hear whispers of the Borg yeah. whenever they're close by. We ne- didn't have a reason to believe why that was happening, um, but it was happening, and this kind of just nails it as to that's why he, he, he's been biologically changed. He's forever a receiver. And, I, you know, it's even kind of cool that they mention that sort of stuff in the show. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be like fan fiction <laughs> you know, to try to explain things no no that I, I, I felt like somebody when they went to write this thing they lovingly watched every episode of next generation ds9 and voyager in their entirety to just pull on the various strings and nuggets that were laid throughout there that might not have been even intentional but well, they're making it so, so to speak. I, I feel like, though, too, they they went down and they started writing this, and then they even at times went, okay, what will the fans say about this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, then figured out a way to explain it so they wouldn't have to go backpedaling or leave it to other people to try to make stuff up or to just say, well, that doesn't make sense. No, yeah, I don't know who they had consulting all the way through this thing, but... Kudos to them. They, I mean, this was a complicated story to tell. Like, we can pull on the little loose threads here and there, but this was a grand plan. I mean, this is possibly one of the most devious um, things that you've ever seen come out of Star Trek as far as the overarching bad guy plot. I mean, this was the closest to... Yes, we're about to destroy all that you know and love. And they were within a hair's breadth <laughs> of achieving their goal. Talk about some of the other characters. And one character that I'm kind of sorry is gone now is Captain Shaw. You start out absolutely hating this guy. And in the end, you're really sad to see him go. You are. And, and what's interesting the way that they carried his story arc was amazing, but I've, I've had, like, other friends go, you know, I want to see them go back and tell the story of Shaw as captain. And, and I'm like, I'm going to tell you why that's not a good idea. Shaw yeah. told you why that was not a good idea. Shaw very much knew he was the by-the-book, plain vanilla, get-the-job-done captain Mm-hmm. You would have watched essentially Starfleet The Office yeah. <laughs> as, yeah. as a series because Shaw in it took Shaw in this moment with this crew to go. I get why I've been like I've been. I know why you guys do what you do. Go get it done because I can't. Uh, my favorite moment with Shaw. From the get-go, from as soon as you see him, you know, he's pretty much saying, I'm not putting up with your crap. Right. You're not taking my ship. Uh, seven, uh, Hanson, doesn't even call her Seven. Hanson, you're confined to quarters, all that stuff and everything. His ship's in danger. The Shrike, was that, was, right? Yeah, was that the, the Shrike. The, yeah, the Shrike. The Shrike is pretty much got him up against the ropes and everything. They want Jack Crusher. He's going, why the hell should I... Uh, risk the, my entire crew for this kid and Picard says he's my son <laughs> and that's when Shaw is like okay shields up <laughs> arm <laughs> phasers tor- photon torpedoes uh, that just that little you know 
little insight that he is not a total complete ass right there at that moment. I was like, that was a really great scene. And I think you needed that moment. Like he was pretty much screw Picard across the board. And and this is where Wolf 359 comes into play. Um, Very much like uh, Commander and then Captain Sisko. Uh, mm-hmm. Was not a fan of Picard because his wife he lost his wife during the Battle of Wolf Three Five Nine. Right, this guy only lives because a junior officer made a decision in a hot moment in the middle of that battle that had his butt on a uh, escape pod where others were not going on there, and mm-hmm. then just his hatred toward Picard. I totally get that. But when Picard mentions to him that this is my son, in that moment it also humanizes Picard to Shaw, who yeah. he doesn't see him as human. Right. But I, I just I just really love that because he was just like, What's it worth? You know, why is this guy worth so much to you? He's my son. And you see Shaw like crap. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, he he did not do so uh, willingly or lovingly. It just okay. My sensibilities will not allow me to just fork this guy over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they gave him a a really nice in the end with his uh, his uh, officer review of seven. Yeah, that that was a really great uh, scene. You you thought his death scene was good, right? But the scene. A day or two before his death was actually better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that that was amazing. But uh, I, I, even while he was being basically a dick, <laughs> uh, um, it was hard not to like him any even then because uh, while you didn't want to, when he was calling out Picard and Riker before he let, uh, unleashed on the whole. You're Locutus, and you destroyed my ship and my crew and all the people I knew and loved. Um, before he launched into all of that, just picking on them for all the stuff that the crew of the Enterprise always found themselves in. And let's face it, if if we were to watch, like I said, if we were to watch the series where Shaw is the captain of the Titan, you're just going to see Milk Run kind of stuff all day long because... He's a by the book. We're just going to carry out the mission and then we're going to go. And he wouldn't and he didn't probably ever get in into those standard TV series scrapes. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, but, it's getting too hot. Got to go. <laughs> but yeah, you got to figure in normal every day. Uh, if, if this is a real world, it, Starfleet's a real thing. The Federation is a real thing. And most of the. Most of the galaxy is fairly calm most of the time. Most of the activities of Starfleet are going to be pretty... Mundane. Mundane. They're just going to be a thing that happens because it's got to happen. It's how we stay in contact. It's how we do defense. It's how we transport goods, get things going. It's very routine. Yeah, you never got the impression that the Titan was a long-range explorer vessel. No, 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 no. The Shaw's kind of describing it, that as, okay, you guys seem to always be getting into crap. <laughs> right. That's not how this works. <laughs> so. Yeah, and when he would call him out, I mean, it, it, most for the most part, I mean, he was in the right. There was never, that was the, that was what's so loving about his character. You might not like what he's saying because he's saying bad things about your favorite characters, but he's not wrong. Right. <laughs> Oh, I was talking about uh, nods to other series. We had nods to the original series. Oh, yeah. And a real big one towards the very end. How oh, cool yeah. was it when you heard the vo- voice of Walter Koenig? And, and for anyone paying attention, that was a double dip. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. By naming, by having his, his son be named Anton. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I really like that. Yeah, no, that that was amazing. When I heard his voice come on, uh, I, I was just, I was locked in my chair. I'm like, that's awesome. For those who but not know what, exactly what we're talking about, having his first name Anton, that was definitely an homage to Anton Yelchin, 
who played uh, Chekhov in the uh, Star Trek reboot films, who tragically passed away in uh, 2016, I think it was. Yeah, freak freak car accident with his own car. Yeah, yeah, very, very freak accident. Very unfortunate. Really just incredible talented actor. Um, but yeah, so that was a very, like you said, a, a great double dip. Yeah, the president of the Federation. Given Chekhov's status in the original series and the movies and how, how he, he just didn't elevate that... Hi, at least in the time that we saw him. Yeah, he's um, comedy relief. <laughs> he, he was so to see uh, to see that probably his father did rise to higher heights, but then his son really to the highest of heights uh, gives a little more grandeur to the character. It was very nice. Absolutely. Now I got to talk about this. We we mentioned that the Enterprise D makes an appearance. Yes. The story as it goes and everything, you know, all the ships, they can't use any current ships because they all have, they've all turned effectively Borg. They have some ridiculous system that allows every ship to act as one or mm-hmm. something. So they need a ship, as, as Jordy puts it, that's analog. <laughs> yeah, analog. And so they go to the, uh, the ship, the, the, the Federation uh, Ship Museum. And as soon as you get there, you know what's happening, probably even before. Mm -hmm. You know what's happening. You you just have a sense, you know, what's going to happen. The lovingly recreation of the Enterprise D bridge Mm -hmm. was fantastic. Seeing our crew reunited on the bridge was fantastic. I was doing pretty good through all that. I was feeling happy. I was feeling, uh, I was definitely feeling emotional, but I was holding it together. Until I heard Majel's voice. Yep. <laughs> I, I'll admit it, a tear fell. Yeah, no, I, I, I was super choked up. And it was, of course, obviously just something lifted from the uh, series. Well, I had actually uh, read something once where she actually recorded a ton of material that, and, and gave permission for her voice to just persistently be used. Mm-hmm. as ships computers so um yeah they had a huge bank to pull from yeah but that was just it was a really nice touch and that was like the icing on the cake for that scene i mean that truly turned it into the old crew was back <laughs> well and, and even when jordy uh restores uh the bridge uh it, 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 if we're sticking with just the ship itself there was a crew that actually rebuilt that bridge like it didn't exist anymore. So the set mm-hmm. designers, loving every loving detail, uh, restored that thing. But when he restored it from obviously the trash heap that it was after it crash landed on a planet, uh, he restored it to how it was in the series, not yes. how it was in the movie. In the, yeah, in the film. Yeah. So that was an extra nice touch. Yeah, I read a, a Facebook friend of mine's comment. He watched, that was in episode nine. And he admitted that he got pretty emotional seeing that scene as well. And I and I shared the, the same story I just told you. And he's like, and he replied, this is like, it really hit home how important Next Generation is to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Because you get so choked up so emotional and so involved with with seeing these people on that bridge and how all the notes that it that it strikes within you oh yeah no i mean we we revisited that every year for seven years and loved yeah. every minute of it couldn't wait for the next one so yeah seeing it again like that and then getting all the right notes uh getting magil on all that it's just perfection and interestingly enough uh, because i've been reading whatever i can consume about making it and all that and interestingly enough so the 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 gold placard uh bearing Mm -hmm. uss enterprise on there right they had to lock that thing up oh i'm sure uh yeah they wanted to make sure nobody walked off (laughs) <laughs> with the placard because if there was any trophy from all of that from any prop that anyone wanted to probably walk off with it would have been that placard 
Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Yeah. Oh, and there's actually a fun thing. Um, the actor that played Shaw, um, he had his picture taken on on, <laughs> on the bridge of Enterprise D. And, and in the little caption that I saw with it, he said, well, the man sat in my chair. I can sit in his. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, absolutely, uh, that was too much fun. <laughs> no, Trek in general is just one of those things that uh, it's important to me. the The whole idea of it, you know, the the start of Picard opens with, of course, the sort of the the Trek notes, mm -hmm. and I can't hear those without feeling joy. Oh no, absolutely. Um, and it, it, did you catch um, in the final episode when Enterprise D is warping toward um, Earth, well, at least the Sol system, we pass through some of the opening credit scenes from from the next generation. The star field that, that appears right at the beginning of every episode during the credit sequence, they... They passed through that again in the D. I'm like, that's just too sweet. Yeah, there was a, a few shots of the D that were very reminiscent of the ones that were used in the in the series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. You know, it was a great touch. It was great seeing the ship, you know, again on the on the screen, and you you miss it. <laughs> <laughs> you really kind of do because I, I I like anyone else when the series started. I'm like, wow. That thing's big and fat. It was, and wasn't sold on it. Yeah, it wasn't sold on it right away. Oh, what was uh, what was it? All the little trophies at the like the uh, the bar near yeah, the they academy give or away. They No, give no one wants no one wants the fat one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the the galaxy class was an acquired taste. <laughs> yep, but I did like the uh, the the teaser at the very end. We should talk about the teaser at the very end of the show. Absolutely. Uh, Jack Crusher is being assigned to the new Enterprise G, which, by the way, so we only had an Enterprise F for a year. <laughs> what the hell happened to that poor thing? Yeah, I kind of want to go back and rewatch. Uh, I don't think it was destroyed during the battle. No, I don't believe it was. So they apparently must have uh, rechristened that one as well. Well, and the F apparently had been... Let's see, the F and that particular Enterprise F, that's an Odyssey class... Um, that was bore out of, uh, Star Trek Online. Yeah, I just wonder how many Star Trek Online fans that are upset that <laughs> their <laughs> ship appeared for all of, like, 30 seconds. Right, and, and, and we didn't even get the full sense of that thing, because that particular class of ship is, was supposed to be, like, the largest ever at the time. It and, looked mighty big. And, well, it's intended for deep space mission, and, uh, it's a, essentially... A, a floating star base. It, it, it's able to operate as a base of operations in a particular area. That's what it was intended mm -hmm. for. And we didn't even get a sense of the bridge. The bridge of an Odyssey class, you thought um, the Titans bridge was huge. This is like being in an open stadium <laughs> sure. on, on Enterprise F. But yeah, I, I, I guess they were retiring it. I, I, I guess that was part of the deal with Federa um, 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 Federation Day. Federation Day. I, yeah, I had that in my head, and it wasn't sounding right for some reason. But Federation Day. So, yeah, the big reveal of F coming out and the, forming up the fleet was supposed to be, I think, its send-off. I assumed it was its premiere. That's... Yeah, that's kind of what we were thinking, but I've, it's apparently been around longer than that. So I left that moment going, yeah, are we? do we have F and G fl and D fly, <laughs> flying around all at the same time? And E is apparently in a trash heap somewhere. Yeah, we don't know what happened to E. That wasn't Worf's fault. Though. It wasn't Worf's fault. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and A exists, too. A is at the Fleet Museum. A is at the Fleet Museum, yes. So we got most of the alphabet, as is uh, NX-01. Is yes, the NX01, the, the refit version of NX01. Yes, so. yes. Sorry for the going down that rabbit hole. Jack has joined Starfleet, yes. been accelerated, uh, so he's already an ensign after a year of the Academy. Mm -hmm. He's been assigned to the new Enterprise G, or the, well, not new, uh, the refitted and rechristened uh, 
Enterprise G. Yep. And one of the first things he puts on his desk in his quarters is the model of the fat one. (laughs) (laughs) The Enterprise D. Right next to the picture of his parents. (laughs) Yes. I thought that was a nice touch. Yeah, no, that was beautiful. But the big reveal at the very end is an appearance from Q. Right. That had to hit everyone by surprise. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I'm uh, like, jaw was on the floor. And and I love that they addressed it right away. I'm like, uh, Jack is literally asking, aren't you dead? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And and, and of course, in perfect Q style, like, uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Oh, oh, you're... Your kind are so pedantically linear. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, and then just kind of alluding to the notion that this could be the launch of a new series, and that Q might be along to torment. Uh, uh, like, yes, yeah, so your your father's trial is over, but yours has just begun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was a cute little line. Yeah, I I think they. To keep that scene under wraps, I'm guessing the only people that knew about that was probably Ed Spielers, Jack De- um, John Delancey, whoever filmed it. Right. <laughs> yeah, you gotta feel like they they somebody ran off into a, a corner <laughs> with a with a set piece and just said, "We're just gonna do this." And yeah, yeah, because I I'm amazed that that did not leak that John Delancey was gonna make an appearance. Right. Yeah. No. Like I would. I had to make it my mission to watch this every Thursday when it came out because aside from friends here that were watching it religiously and I'd get texts because my friend Scott would be watching it at lunch on every Thursday and he'd just start texting, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> like, yep. Fine, I'll get home, I'll watch it just so you just shut up. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I did everything I could to avoid some spoilers. And, yes, it and it was very difficult. It was, it was getting, getting very difficult. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure maybe that's why I knew Enterprise D was coming, because I probably skimmed really quickly and passed, like, a publicity shot of, like, the crew on a bridge, and... No, 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 no move, no, no. move, move! <laughs> I can't see it, not yet! Uh, but yes, uh, a really fun series, a great end to Picard. Uh, Patrick Stewart, now 82 years old, I think he's finally going to hang up uh, Star Trek. I, I think so too. But I mean, this is also a vindication over some of the lackluster movies that that were out. Like, oh, it definitely it definitely makes up for Nemesis. And Nemesis, yeah, Nemesis was such a disaster. I mean, I, I know we need to probably wrap this up, but I mean, we didn't even get it into like how they chose to deal with data. I actually thought was rather eloquent, eloquent, yeah. um, an amazing way to go. And they gave him such good scenes to um, him trying to console Picard at the at the one point, and he just nailed it. Yeah, you know, like he mm-hmm. completely nailed the moment. And, yeah, I mean, I could talk about this all day long. Yeah, no, we should. This is the longest time hop we've ever done. <laughs> we kind of knew it would be. <laughs> yeah, I had a feeling. But, yeah, we'll we'll put this to bed for now. And uh, you got a really big bonus episode. Let us know what you thought of Star Trek Picard. Please send us some yes. messages. Follow the link in the show notes to all the social media outlets. Or send us an email, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks very much for listening. We will be back in a week with a regular episode. We are not done with Ed Spielers, as a matter of fact. Yes. Um, And we'll save that for next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. See ya. Oh, that's your line. I'll say. That's my line. Go make Star Trek Legacy now. Okay. See ya. (laughs) Bye, everybody. Bye.